This series, Generations, has uh, really been amazing. We've heard more from people about this series than any other series I've ever preached. It's amazing. Um, we have even churches that are watching this online. We had a gentleman last night who, uh, who said, I, I, I come here on a Saturday night, uh, and, but I go to another church. I'm a member of another church. I said, oh, okay. He said, I'm taking everything you're teaching here and taking back to my church. Will that be a problem? I said, absolutely not. Uh, we are an open book. All the notes are on the blog, and anything we can do to explain what you need, we're here for that because we believe that this discussion is so important. So without further ado, Nicole, Ryan Elizabeth, if you would make your way to the stage. And as they're coming up, you noticed the words true relationships because we're talking about Gen Z today, a generation that's born between 2000 and 2015. True relationship is the cry of the hour. I have a lot of friends. I don't know half of them, to be honest. They were a friend of a friend, and we had 50 mutual friends. So yeah, okay, I accept your friendship. I really don't know who they are. And a lot of times people are operating as if we have friends, but really, truly, uh, there is a, a missing link. I want to open up with John 15 and verse 12. This is a powerful statement talking about friendship. Jesus said, John 15 and verse 12, greater love, of oh, verse 13, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends. Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says, you are my friends. If you do whatever I command you, no longer do I call you servants because a servant does not know what his master is doing. A lot of other gods, goddesses, philosophies, systems tell you to serve them. Jesus says, no, I'm not calling you a servant. I'm calling you my friend. But I have called you friends for all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. In this world where true relationships are lacking, Jesus said, I want to be your friend. When you come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you realize you're not just in the presence of God, you're in the presence of God who wants to be your friend. And how do you know that? By faith, you know that is real. It is more real than this physical world in which we live. And those of you who know Jesus Christ, you know what that friendship is like. The whole world can walk away from you. Your family can turn against you. But if you know Jesus Christ, you're never alone. That is the friendship we're talking about. And in this series, our goal is uh, not just to entertain, but to educate. It's not just to draw caricatures of different generations, but to really come to know them. Uh, it is not to poke fun. I can, we can put a lot of TikTok videos up there making fun of different generations, but that's not going to achieve anything. Uh, we want to stoke the faith of all generations, especially the younger ones. So as we begin... We're talking about Gen Z, and so I'm going to ask Nicole to tell us a little bit about what they were up against or what they have been up against. Uh, what I want to make clear about this, um, these things that I'm going to be sharing, is that, yes, our kids in Gen Z have gone through some of these, but actually, a lot of these things happened to us. We may have been parents we may not have been parents at the time, but we have taken a lot of these things that happened and we have incorporated those anxieties and those fears into our parenting styles. So without further ado, anybody remember Y2K? Sitting and watching the computer. <laughs> and, one, and as midnight got closer, you're waiting for the computer just to implode <laughs> and everything else just to go offline and the world was gonna to come to an end as we knew it. That didn't happen, of course. So in, but also in 2000, the dot-com bubble, bubble burst. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, in the 1990s, the internet was a new thing. It was growing by leaps and bounds. Then we have the technology companies, the startups. They run through all of their cash and their money and easy capital. And then as they are overconfident in how they are going along and all the speculation, they fold and they lose billions of dollars. Then came 
And I know that if I asked every single person in this room, do you remember where you were? We can all attest, we can all remember. And the one thing that, that just struck me about remembering 9-11 was I, you know, we were inundated for weeks and weeks and weeks of footage of what was going on, of eyewitness um, things that were being said. And I remember after about two weeks, my mind and my emotions couldn't take anymore. So I ventured to change the channel to watch something else. And I felt guilty. I felt guilty for trying to move on while all these people were suffering. Right on the heels of this came the Enron crisis. And this of course led to more lack of trust in big corporations. Then we had the war on terror in Iraq and Afghanistan. And of course this particular one hit close to home because I have a brother-in-law who did a tour in Afghanistan and a tour, two tours in Iraq, but he was in Afghanistan during 9-11. So um, having someone close to you who is in harm's way day in and day out, not knowing, and this was, the, this was days before FaceTime and Skype, and they were, um, my sister and her husband were having to write letters, or you know, there was five minute phone calls. Um, so that stress was also there. Then starting in 2005, something called social media was born. The first one that I remember as a parent was MySpace. And I was really suspicious. I don't know about anybody else, but I was really suspicious of this. What is this MySpace? So then we get uh, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat and uh, TikTok. And I did jump on the bandwagon and I brought him with me. And, you know, but I, I was a little bit further back. I was like 2009 before I jumped on the Facebook bandwagon. Um, then in 2007 to 2009, we have the Great Recession. Many people lost their jobs, their homes, and their savings. Unemployment was at an all-time high. Then we have mass shootings beginning in the terrorizing schools, shopping malls, concerts, and other public places. And for me, personally, 2012, Sandy Hook Elementary School, my youngest child was the age of many of those children that were killed that day. And I remember him walking through my back door after school and he had his little backpack on his back and I just grabbed him and I hugged him and I thought, there's a lot of parents this today that cannot hug their children. And that really impacted me as a parent. Then we have smartphones that became more and more common and they're indispensable now. I grew up in a time where we didn't have cell phones. We didn't, you know, we went to a payphone and nobody knows what a payphone is today. But I cannot even imagine my life today without a cell phone. I don't, I can't figure out how, how I survived before that, before that point. <laughs> um, mental health has become a big issue. And then in 2020, the whole world shuts down. We called it a pandemic. And at the same time, we saw, and this is where I feel like a lot of our kids that are in this Gen Z generation, these images were coming in, whether on their computers, on televisions, on their phones, and they're seeing their big cities with the racial unrest, the destruction of property across the board. And this has taken a toll, not only on the parents, but on the kids. And then, of course, during all of this, we as parents, we changed, and also our parenting styles have changed. And so the reason that we share this with you is because we are all responsible for Gen Z. It's not a matter of whether you have kids that fall in that age range or Gen Z or even Generation Alpha, which is kind of where we are in parenting. All of us are responsible because God has entrusted all of us with Gen Z and Generation Alpha in our church family. And I mean, I see my students in the back back there and kind of peppered throughout over here. So let me, let me preface everything by saying this. We love those students. They are the greatest students in the entire world because they get it. They understand what it means to have a relationship with God and to live out their faith. And if you don't have a relationship with them, you're missing out. 
So we're going to talk today about uh, some characteristics of Gen Z, um, some challenges that they have to overcome, and where we as leaders, where we as the church step in. A lot of times people have, they've adopted this phrase of when anything is wrong in society, they just kind of roll their eyes and go, oh, millennials. Just kind of uh, like elbow each other, like, right, millennials. Everything was fine before the millennials. We are millennials. So Gen Z is younger than we are. Sometimes those terms get misapplied, especially the further we get from a particular generation. Gen Z is early 20s and down. So these are, these are young adults and teenagers that we're talking about today. Let me read off some of these words and see if they, they are familiar to those of you who interact with Gen Z on a regular basis. Gen Z is private, where they've seen millennials kind of strike out and put things on social media and then maybe regret the things that we posted on social media. Gen Z has learned from that and they are much more private in what they share. They'll share things on Snapchat where messages will disappear in 24 hours. Or they'll share things on alternate Instagram accounts where they can have one post that goes to one group of people and another post that goes to another group of people. They're much more anxious than previous generations. And we can roll our eyes at this, but let me ask you, all these crises that Nicole mentioned, when those crises were happening, you could turn the TV off and walk away from it. You could put your phone down and walk away from it. These students are growing up with those crises in the palm of their hand 24 seven. If we were teenagers today, we would be anxious as well. They're restless. And this comes from trying to figure out where they fit. This is a normal part of, of the teenagers trying to figure out where their identity lies, shifting their identity from their parents to their peers. But with all of these forms of social media, with all of these different interactions they have with people, it creates an uneasiness, a restlessness in them because they don't have that settled sense of identity. They're tech savvy. If you have ever had a tech problem, it is likely that you called a Gen Z member of your family to come and fix it. Hey, can you program this? Hey, can you reconnect this? My Bluetooth isn't working. Some of you don't even know what a Bluetooth is. <laughs> we were setting up things this morning and I was furiously texting Gen Z like, hey, can you come fix this? Hey, this isn't connected. And lo and behold, Gen Z comes in the door and they fix it in 30 seconds What I was stressing over. They're tech savvy. They're entrepreneurial. They are more creative in how they approach problems and they're able to solve problems that you didn't even know existed. They are redemptive. Equality is a top tier issue for them. They wanna be the hero. They, they are born believing that they can change the world because they're born into a world and a culture that is constantly changing. And a lot of what we're, a lot of what we're um, sharing with you today comes from Tim Elmore's book, Generation Z uh, Unfiltered, which is a fantastic resource. If you work with Generation Z in any capacity, I would encourage you to go out and check out that resource. We want to share some challenges that Gen Z uh, faces and how we as adults, as leaders, can help them overcome them. Something that we see in Gen Z um, is they have access without experience. Um, we know that when we've talked about technology and social media and things, they literally have information at their fingertips, sometimes even by voice command. I could probably say, hey Siri right now, and your phones might light up, right? Somebody's She's gonna fine. listen. Um, my kids do that all the time. They wanna they want know something and I don't know it, so we say, you know, we, we ask the phone because it's instant, it's so easy to do. Um, so they've got that virtual assistant to just give them that information at, at the drop of a hat. Um, and social media consumption is at an all-time high. But unlike movies and video games and things like that, there are no ratings on social media. So where we would previously have guidelines to prevent our kids from seeing violence or sexuality or hearing foul language, there's no longer those filters. Um, yes, there are things that we can try to put in place, but most of the time it's just, it's out there. So they are seeing this media, they're consuming it, but they may not be um, emotionally or cognitively, cognitively ready for that information. They're overexposed to information far earlier than they're ready for, and they're underexposed to firsthand experiences far later than they're ready. There's this abundance of information, but without those experiences, they're not gaining wisdom. And if, if we as adults bring that sense of wisdom and experience, I'm just gonna be real honest, we've dropped the ball. As adults, as leaders in Generation Z's life, when it comes to technology and social media, many of us have dropped the ball when it comes to accountability. They need those adults, those trusted leaders to come into their lives and help them establish healthy boundaries and parameters where social media and uh, media consumption comes in. And we've just, we've simply left them to unfiltered access to the information of the world. So what can we do? 
um, we can push them to experience life beyond the screens, beyond these, these theories and these things that they're seeing. And we can pair this empowering information. Like I said, they have a wealth of information at their fingertips. Pair them with experiences. Um, what that looks like here is church attendance, church participation. Um, they need to be in church where they're exposed to different families, different, uh, different family dynamics, different life experiences. Dr. Shaw has talked about intergenerational. That's where we need more than just the kids, more than just the teenagers, more than just the young adults. We need the entire church. That will help them be exposed to different lifestyles, different experiences, and then help them gain wisdom through their own experiences with that. It's also up to us to teach Gen Z that there are ethical standards and moral absolutes. This is foreign terms to many of Gen Z that's growing up today, but there, there are things that do not budge. There are things that do not change, namely God's word. Mm -hmm. What God says about us, what God says about who we are, that does not change. And it's up to us. We can't rely on Gen Z to figure that out. That's not, that's not helpful for them. It's up to us to show them that that is true and to model that for them. We need to bring that sense of accountability and be adults that they trust, adults that are transparent with them, adults that are respected, Adults that are understanding, not just be like, you're like this and you're always gonna be like this, who are understanding that the world that Gen Z is growing up in is different than the world that you and I grew up in. And they, we need to be uh, a safe place for them to share both their triumphs and their struggles. Another challenge we see with Gen Z is there's, they have stimulation without ownership. Um, have you ever heard the saying, keeping kids busy will keep them out of trouble? We know that that's not necessarily true. Um, while they may be physically busy and they can't cause physical chaos in that sense, this overstimulation can actually lead to the mental health issues, the stress, the anxiety, depression, and all of those things are a different kind of trouble that we don't want for our own kids, we don't want for your kids or grandchildren. In an effort to shape our children into well-rounded individuals, sometimes we overschedule them. We sign them up for all the sports, all the extracurriculars, art, music, um, tutoring lessons, all of these things, which are good things, and they're good things that we want for our children. Um, and in some ways, they even appreciate. Mom and dad have this figured out. They know where I'm going next. They've got this, they've got this. I'm just gonna follow my schedule and I'm good. But at the same time, they also want free time. They want to choose what they're doing and when they're doing it. So by scheduling and doing all of this, we are not giving them ownership over their own growth and learning. What we've seen is uh, parenting styles have shifted with Generation Z. We talk a lot about um, helicopter parents, parents that are hovering and just present for everything. Uh, we've seen parenting shift toward more of a snowplow and lawnmower parent. Now let me explain what those mean. Uh, snowplow parents are ones that go in front of their kids and clear the path. They remove every obstacle, every hindrance, and everything that could possibly bring a negative feeling upon them. Those are snowplow parents. Uh, lawnmower parents, on the other hand, lawn, lawn care typically falls into one of two categories. If you're like me, you just get out there and you cut the grass and you get the job done. There are some people, maybe some people in this room, who are very meticulous in how they care for their lawn. You have to have the exact right chemicals that you treat your lawn with and you have the, all the tools and maybe you're even down there measuring the individual blades of grass to make sure everything is uniform. I don't know. But lawnmower parents are the ones who are meticulously plotting out and planning every single moment of their kids' lives. And while we needed to care for our kids, while we need to protect our kids, that meticulous planning and overscheduling can lead to that feeling of being overwhelmed. Helping them through this looks like giving them a voice. Helping them figure out what they wanna do instead of being told what they need to want to do. Giving them the opportunity to make decisions leads them to that ownership that we want them to have into adulthood. That may look like giving them ultimate goals, help them, helping them focus on these ultimate goals, these outcomes, rather than specific tasks. Or teaching them how to think instead of teaching them what to think. In our context, in student ministry, that looks like group activities, small groups, open-ended questions, things where they can look at, at the Bible, study God's word, and they're able to work through these faith issues that they may have so that they are taking ownership over their faith rather than just us preaching it at them. That gives them the opportunity to take ownership over that faith. That's right, and with, with technology, we've mentioned that a lot, and, and with those lawnmower parents who are kind of meticulously plotting out every detail of their kids' lives, creating all these opportunities for them. It's led to a sense of privileges without responsibility. 
because they're getting all of these things, but they aren't taking ownership of all of these things. In the meantime, we hear about younger generations being entitled or operating from a sense of entitlement. Let me just ask you the question that is you know, hanging in the room. Why do you think they have a sense of entitlement? Could it be because we have let them grow up in a sense of entitlement? Could it be that we have crafted this identity for them where they feel like they are owed all of these things because mom and dad have provided for their every, not just their every need, but their every want. We've given them everything. So naturally they're gonna grow up feeling that sense of entitlement. Teens are working less today than they have in previous generations. And maybe that's due to that overscheduling that we talked about. But mom and dad are meeting my needs. Why do I need to go work? I'm just gonna do what I wanna do. So what is the solution then? How do we, how do we fix this in our context? We need to teach them to be grateful for what they have. Um, the, the new things, you know, we wanna give them their wants. Yes, by all means, we need to meet their needs. But maybe let them show responsibility. Let them work for things that they want. By, give, by being grateful for what they have, they, they appreciate things more. We also need to combine rights with responsibility. My kids, our oldest are 10, and they've been asking, you know, when do we get a phone? How, when, when do we get, do we, is it when we're 12? Is it when we're 13? You know, like they have this age set in mind, that's when they're supposed to get a phone. And what we're trying to teach them is you have to show responsibility first. It's, it's not a right. It is, it is a privilege in a way, um, but they do have to have that responsibility. So teaching them those things, that allows them to, again, take ownership over things. So in the church context, that looks like serving, that's getting them signed up to serve in nursery, in Blaze, in Awana, in the AV booth, um, all of the different ways. When they are serving, they take ownership over their church experience. They appreciate more about what goes on behind the scenes, what is needed to, to put on you know, three services on a Sunday morning. But it also urges them to be grateful for the messages that Dr. Shaw prepares, that Ryan prepares as well. Serving is something that we have set as the expectation with Dr. Sean and Nicole here at Clearview. We've set the expectation for our students that serving is what is expected of you when you come to church. And this helps deal, them deal with this other challenge that they face, individualism without perspective. Gen Z is growing up in a culture that is designed to crank out narcissists. And I'm not saying that everybody in Gen Z is narcissistic, but I am saying that that is how our culture is designed. I mean, think about the terminology that we have. On TikTok, you have a for you page. You establish your profile on different social media platforms. You have an algorithm and ad experiences that are tailored to what you wanna look at when you wanna look at it. You have recommended videos that just kind of scroll to the next thing of what people have decided that you need to watch based on your experience. And because, on these different platforms, they're being fed these dangerous messages. Things like, you, if you are triggered, then whatever triggered you needs to be canceled. If you are upset in any way, then whatever's making you uncomfortable needs to be removed. If you are surrounded by a particular environment or set of people, then it is their job, their responsibility to meet your physical and emotional needs. And these are simply not true and they're harmful to our students' development. Yes, we need to care for them. Yes, we need to meet their needs, but we also need to teach them some resilience and we need to teach them some perspective to be able to look beyond themselves. One of the ways that we do that here at Clearview is by, is by prioritizing service. Not just here at church, but we have you know, various trips we go on. We have a spring retreat next weekend. We have a mission trip that we're gonna take this summer and essential components of each one of those trips are serving people. Because it feels good to get a job done, but it also accomplishes a larger task of helping Gen Z look beyond themselves. Notice that there are other people in the world. They don't live just in a fishbowl. There are other people in the world around them who have needs, wants, desires, hopes, heartaches, and uh, it helps them see that God has called them to meet the needs of others. One of the things we said on a mission trip, I believe it was last year, that we've heard from a lot of students and parents how impactful it was, is we told our students, you are not the main character. A lot of times we feel like we are, we are the central character, we are the hero of our story. You are not the main character, God is. You are playing a part in a much larger story. Something else we see is fluidity without integrity. Today's teens are part of this complex ecosystem of belonging. They want more likes, more views, more shares. That's, that's where they find value. They find that value in what others think about them. They want to belong. Sometimes this means that they have different personas, different aspects of themselves based on which social media platform they may be on. So on TikTok or YouTube, they might put a video out there that, of something they've created, a song they've written or a little short reel or something that they are proud of, that this is something I've made. 
But then we go to Instagram and we see them poised and put together. And this is, this is more, my life is perfect. This is what I want you to see. And then you go over to Snapchat and they're a little more loose. It's a little silly. It's more fun. It's more relatable. So they have these different personas based on where they're, which social media they're on. And in reality, their adolescent brains are not capable of holding on to that confusion of, oh, I'm supposed to be this here, but now I'm this over here. And we see they do that in person as well. It kind of depends on who they're around. They may act this way with a certain group of people and this way over here. So can you imagine, not only in social media, but in person, being these different people, these different versions of themselves, and it's, it's gotta be exhausting. Uh, this is even translated to uh, this idea of gender identity. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can be whatever you feel like being in the moment. There's the spectrum, everything is fluid. There's no absolutes. And maybe your students don't have those particular struggles. Maybe they're not struggling with those things about gender identity or transgenderism, but the culture and the media that they're consuming is pushing them toward this idea of being an ally. Maybe you're not dealing with this, but you need to be an ally to those who are. You need to protect those who are. You need to validate those who are. And if you think that there is not an agenda behind the social media, not only that you use, but that your students use, you need to wake up. And I wanna point out identity is kind of a buzzword in our society right now. So just to clarify what we are talking about here, identity is not what they think or what they feel in any given moment. That's, that's the fluidity, that's how it changes. Their identity and our identity needs to come from the Bible, what God's word says about who we are. And that, like Ryan said earlier, that's unchanging. That is the standard that we expect for them. So we, uh, we, we see this, uh, this idea of opportunity without resilience as well. They, they are presented with all these different opportunities, these different things that they can do, right? We talked about the lawnmower parents who are meticulously plotting out their kids' lives but they don't have this sense of resilience because if they go into something and they don't like it, well, they just jump to something else. If they try this and they don't like it, they just jump to something else. Try this instead. Just kind of shuffle through things until you find what fits and do it while it fits. And then if it doesn't fit anymore, just jump to the next thing. Um, they, when things become too difficult, they often run to mom and dad to fix those problems because we've done that for them. And again, we're not saying don't take care of your kids. Like we would never say that, but we are saying it's okay to help them walk through hard situations. Instead of presenting them from difficulty, teach them how to work through and overcome difficulty. Model that for them. Show them what it means to be resilient. Show them what it means to have grit, to have tenacity, to have passion, and to fight for the things that are important to you. This looks like giving them opportunities to grow, mastering a new skill, solving a problem, encountering new people, or taking on a new challenge. And one of the ways that we do that here at Clearview is through our Illuminate uh, Leadership Initiative. This is something that we are you know, very passionate about in meeting with Dr. Shaw and identifying these future leaders, um, we, we take kids, groups of four at a time, and we take them through a 12-week curriculum from the John Maxwell Foundation that teaches them leadership principles and strategies, how to be leaders in their context. And then we give them opportunities to put those into practice. We don't just give them that information. We give them opportunities to step up and lead, lead amongst their peers, lead in, uh, in Illuminate, in Catalyst and things that we're doing. And at the end of those 12 weeks, their graduate project is to stand up and give a, a lesson to their peers. And when we mention that to them, they get this deer in the headlights look like I can't stand in front of people and talk, that's terrifying. Uh, but we give them the tools that they need to stand up and to be the leaders that God has called them to be, to develop that sense of resilience. Given the opportunity, students can develop resilience. And that's, that's what's gonna help galvanize, galvanize them into being men and women of God. We can help them see that it's okay to do hard things. Another thing that we see that they have is consumption without reflection. We've talked about internet and social media and the internet has decided that minors are, are good to see adult information. They can handle it. Um, the age to sign up for most apps and websites and things is 13. So we're talking about young, brand new teenagers who are handling this adult information. And this is years before they have the critical thinking skills to be able to even handle it all. Are they able to distinguish between reputable sources? Can they fact check? We rely a lot on social media to fact check. That doesn't help. They need to be able to do this on their own. Can they look at pictures that are posted and see, oh, that's just a filter? Or do they think that this beautiful woman that they see on Instagram is really that beautiful? It's not a makeup filter. It's not a facial reconstruction for the perfect face. They need these skills because otherwise they are, you know, they have this difficulty deciphering what's real 
And they're also left to wonder, is this the standard that I'm supposed to meet? If it's all fake, they don't know what they're relying on. So then the answer is to teach them to think critically, but how do we do that, right? That's an abstract thing. There's no prescribed way to teach somebody how to think critically. One of the ways that we found, and uh, Tim Elmore actually mentions this in his book, is by utilizing what's called design thinking, or it's, it's learning in light of a problem. You present them with a problem, either real or imaginary, and then let them work to figure it out. And along the way, if needed, you give them the tools and resources that they need to be able to assemble the skills in order to fix that problem, to solve that problem. This teaches them empathy. It teaches them how to identify with other people. It teaches them problem-solving skills. And it helps fight against that narcissism that we talked about and that impulsivity or fear of risk-taking or failure. Uh, it tells them that it's okay to strike out and try new things and, and maybe fail because you have people that are gonna help pick you back up. Uh, so in our context, this looks like raising the standard for our Gen Z students. And this is something that we are passionate about. Too many times we have seen people lower the standard for what Gen Z is capable of. Oh, they're not gonna be interested in that. They're not gonna understand that. So just why don't you just keep things down here? And what we found is that if you keep the bar low for Gen Z and even Generation Alpha, they're gonna rise to meet that bar because it's very low, it's very attainable. It's not a lot of risk involved. But if you raise the bar for Gen Z and Generation Alpha, they're gonna, ra they're gonna rise to that standard. They're gonna rise to the standard that you set for them and they're gonna meet that expectation because they're hungry to learn. They're hungry for true relationships, like Dr. Shaw mentioned. They're hungry for authenticity. They wanna know that you care about them and that you have their best interests at heart. So for our students, this looks like exposing them to issues related to apologetics, how to answer difficult questions about their faith. This looks like teaching them the original languages behind the text, Hebrew and Greek. We found that our students are very like, excited to learn those things. This looks like dealing with issues related to textual criticism. And I'm thankful to have Dr. Shaw because there's a lot of times that I'll send them over to him and be like, hey, you need to ask Dr. Shaw that question because he can answer it a lot better than I can. Um, but beyond that, uh, you know, Dr. Shaw and Nicole, we're so thankful to both of you for creating a culture here at Clearview where students are prioritized and given opportunities to step up and lead. One of the things that frustrates us the most is when people keep teenagers at arm's length because they're scary or because they are weird or because we don't understand them. Make an effort to understand them. Get out of your comfort zone and across those generational lines because I'll tell you that we have seen God do incredible things, not just through our students, but through Gen, Gen Z and Generation Alpha. And God is doing an amazing thing in this generation. We've had four, uh, six baptisms this morning and many of them were Gen Z and Generation Alpha. God is moving in incredible ways in these generations, and I'm excited that we get the chance to play a part in what God is doing. I really appreciate Ryan Elizabeth sharing this because in most churches, these, are, these things are not discussed. We talk about you know, how the world is you know, so terrible and how the enemy is there and how kids these days, but we don't take the time to do this. And what happens is, we assume that you know, things happen because of the world or the enemy or even their own flesh when actually God has given us tools, God has given us information. What we shared with you today, parents, if you have Gen Zs, don't walk away saying, but my kids are different. I call those the famous last words. When you say that, our kids are different though, because you know, we do this and this with them. If you don't understand this, what you'll find it is, is this, this dictum of life that I learned somewhere and it just hit me like a ton of bricks. And it's this, kids are more like their peers than their parents. We want them to be like us. We want the kids to be like our, us parents. But more than likely, think about you. How were you growing up? You were more like your friends. And you like their music because that was your music. And you like, you know, doing things that they like to do, not as much what parents did. Now, you loved your parents. You look like them and you had certain traits. But overall, uh, it's, it's a different world. So this discussion is essential. Now, what if your kids are grown? What if, uh, man, I, I wish we had this 10 years ago. That would have made a big difference. Here's my suggestion to you. Read the, reach the kids in your circle of influence. Whether those kids are right here at Clearview or kids in your family, your nieces or nephews or grandkids or great-grandkids, reach the kids in your neighborhood. 
When you see in the newspaper or on social media how so-and-so got in trouble and locked up and, man, they finally caught him. You know, when I see those pictures, and it's sad because that needs to happen. That needs to happen. They need to be locked up. But it breaks my heart because my next question is, who dropped the ball? Well, it's for generations that's been coming. Right, I know. The church dropped the ball. The parents dropped the ball. We dropped the ball because they walked right past or drove right past many, many, many steeples. So they're not those kids. They are our kids. And as this culture moves forward, we talked about uh, you know, all these things that, that, that is falling on top of We didn't even talk about the weed problem. <laughs> we haven't talked as much about the transgenderism and all that is happening. And, but if we don't deal with this, nobody else is. And I'm so grateful. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Nicole, for sharing this. My encouragement to you is to go back and think about relationships. Uh, they need relationship, true relationships. And it starts with the relationship with Jesus Christ. So what do you do if your kids are grown and, and moved on? Reach other kids. And here's what's going to happen. God's going to send somebody to reach your children in their 30s or 40s or whatever age they are. God's going to send somebody to reach them. You go work in his field here. Somebody's going to go work in your field somewhere else. That's how God works. So... This morning as we come to our time of invitation, the most important relationship you can give to your children is their relationship with Jesus Christ. And you can't do that if you don't have one. Or if you're hanging on to the coattails of your wife, your husband, your pastor, your Sunday school teacher, that is not a real relationship with Jesus Christ. A real relationship is a real relationship with Jesus Christ, which means there needs to be a point in your life, just like these young ladies did, where they invited Jesus Christ to be their Savior and King. If you've never done that, you're around the relationship, but you don't have the relationship. John chapter 1, verse 12 says, But as many as received him to them, as many as received Jesus to them, he gave the right to become children of God. We often say, we're all God's children. No, not, not really. Well, in a way, we are. But really, the saved children of God who will spend eternity in heaven with him forever... That right only comes to those who have prayed to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior and King. And you can do that right now. It's a simple prayer that says, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins and take over. I believe that you are God's Son who died, buried, rose again. And even though I can't see you, by faith, I receive you. In that instant, he received your adoption papers. You have been taken into the family of God. You belong to this massive family of people from all over the world. And by the way, they're all over the world. You know, one of the things about the Gen Z generation is the world has become smaller. People are more connected. Listen, don't miss this. People are more connected. Your Gen Zs are more connected to that kid in Africa or that kid in India or that kid in Europe than they are to their own neighbors. Why? Because the world has become so connected because of social media. They're more like them than they are like you. So it's even more important to share the gospel. Never given your heart to Christ, today's the day. And if you have, don't give up on your kids. I know this message may be tough on some of you parents because your kid is not where they need to be. Your child is not walking with God or they're making wrong decisions right now uh, or they are, you know, just blaming you or whatever. Who knows what's happening in your life? But it hurts. A message like this hurts because you go, ah, I wish I knew that. Why didn't I know that? Nicole and I will tell you, we didn't make all the right decisions either. We, we, we indulged in a little bit of uh, snow plowing too. We did a little bit of lawn mowing as well. And a little bit of helicopter. We did all of it. But when shown the truth, we were able to stop and say, wait, we're going to change some things. And we have. 
And in God's timing, it'll bear fruit. But if you don't change and you walk away saying, it's all, it's good. My kids are different. Famous last words. Famous last words.